Hello, and welcome to the Rooted to Truth podcast. I'm your host, Mackenzie Dickinson, and I'm so excited to jump into this discussion with you. The past few weeks, I've been learning about the Constitutional Convention and the difficulties faced by our founders during the framing of the Constitution. I tell you, the way God works is really amazing because as I was learning about the trials faced by our founders, I encountered some trials of my own. Facing difficulty is never fun, but once I allowed myself to learn from my situation rather than fight it, I was given fresh eyes to see the beauty in it all. In applying my personal experience to the history of the Constitutional Convention, the action steps taken became so much more meaningful. Not only that, but in taking time to study history, I am becoming better equipped to love. You might be thinking, what, Mackenzie? That does not make any sense. But it's true. We live in a nation that is fundamentally Christian, and I'll give you an example. Christ taught in John 15, verse 13, that no greater love has any man than that he laid down his life for his friends. In a constitutional republic, the people are responsible for learning and teaching in order to defend and assert liberty. That is not an individual task alone, though. It's a national collective effort. What I mean is that individuals need to learn the law of the land in a unified attempt to defend and preserve it. If we lack the zeal of patriotism, we will fail to demonstrate love towards our neighbors and families because our proactiveness in civil responsibilities directly affects the pursuit of happiness for ourselves, our families, and our neighbors. And that's what I'm so excited to share with you today. So without further ado, let's get started. As I was mentioning in the introduction, studying the Constitution and the historical events of the United States actually is an act of love and obedience to God. Going back to the scripture that I mentioned from John chapter 15, Jesus teaches us that sacrifice for the benefit of those around us in our daily lives is a demonstration of love. I'd like to expound upon that concept, but before I do, I'd like to ask you a question. A lot of times we'll hear people state that their love goes first to God, then to family, and then to their country. But what do you think? Would you agree with that statement? I mean, a week ago, I would have personally been 100% in agreement, but I've been challenged in this way of thinking after analyzing scripture such as John 15 verse 13. I've noticed that in order to love your family adequately, you have to be in defense of their freedoms and their ability to prosper. To do that, you must take a stance civically in order to ensure that their country will not begin to encroach upon their freedoms. Founding father Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, actually said that country should come before family because if we lose control of our country, it will become the enemy of our families. And of course, that's really specific to the United States. It's different when you're living in a tyrannical regime where the government is trying to be God. But in this nation, that is not the structure we have. We have a constitutional republic. And in that constitutional republic, the people are to be proactive with their citizenship. It is a stewardship that they've been entrusted with. So to love God our country, and those around us, we must apply ourselves to understanding the foundations of liberty and prosperity. If we don't love God first, we can't love our nation and we can't fight for our nation without an understanding of the motivational factors behind the cause, and that is to prosper our families and the future generations to come. So yes, taking time to study the Constitution or to become civically engaged is sometimes burdensome, It can seem inconvenient to our busy lives and schedules, but it is that sacrifice that ultimately leads to the betterment of ourselves, our neighbors, and our posterity. 
The last few episodes, we have spent time preparing for a study through the Constitution by analyzing the historical documents that preceded the drafting of the United States Constitution. And we did this because historical context is the key to historical comprehension. Now, the other day, I was, I was taking a course on Western heritage through Hillsdale College. And during the lecture, a professor by the name of Larry P. Arn was explaining to the class why understanding and analyzing history is so important. He gave a beautiful example by telling the class of his recent experience looking out the window while riding in a train. He explained that during his trip on the train, he was sitting with his back facing the direction in which the train was traveling. So as he looked out the window, what he saw directly in front of him was all of the land which they had just passed. And if he looked directly to his side, what he saw was the present location of the train. When he looked to his side, the current location of the train's surroundings looked really blurry because everything was passing by quickly. But it was really difficult to understand exactly what was taking place before him. As he looked straight ahead out the window towards all of the land which they had just passed, he was able to easily analyze every detail of the image. The past was clear, and although they were moving further away from it, as the train continued on, the image was still enough to study and understand. Most importantly, it was in looking at the last location of the train that he could infer information regarding his current surroundings, despite it all looking really blurry. His point in giving this example is that when we look at history, it's a clear image of the things that have passed, but when we look at our current situation, sometimes it can be really difficult to understand what's going on. The way we can understand the current times we live in is by careful examination of where we came from. The thing is, freedom is in knowledge. If we are ignorant, we are subject to bondage. But if we are knowledgeable, we are subject to liberty. So when it comes to reading and learning the Constitution, it is one of the most important things as a citizen of the United States because it teaches us to value freedom and understand the law of the land. In fact, the first U.S. Chief Justice John Jay said, Every member of the state ought diligently to read and to study the Constitution of his country and teach the rising generations to be free. By knowing their rights, they will sooner perceive when they are violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. So as I mentioned, I've been taking a look at the Constitutional Convention because I think it's such an important place to begin when in the process of trying to study the Constitution itself. There's a lot to be said about understanding original intent and taking the time to understand the situations that produced such monumental documents. During the Revolutionary War, the United States operated under the Articles of Confederation. The concept of a confederation was never clearly explained to me in school, but now after studying, I understand that the Confederacy essentially allowed for the 13 states to function as though they were their own little countries. The idea was to leave nearly everything up to the individual states as a means of keeping the power at a local level and in the hands of the people. By governing under a republic structure, a society could be sure to prosper so long as the principles of liberty were valued and upheld by the people. Something that I like to do when I'm studying is to look at the same historical facts taught by people who reject the concept of divine providence. One of the textbooks I read out of, um, it was written by Alan Brinkley, a historian who specialized in liberal studies. In his book, American History, A Survey, Brinkley stated that if the population consisted of sturdy, virtuous, independent property owners, then the republic could survive. If it consisted of a few powerful aristocrats and a great mass of dependent workers, 
then it would be in danger. He went on to state that the Republican vision did not, in other words, envision a society without social gradations. Some people would inevitably be wealthier and more powerful than others, but all people would have to earn their success. There would be no equality of condition, but there would be full equality of opportunity. Of course, there were many things that I failed to agree with Brinkley on, but with this statement, he was absolutely correct. The success of a republic truly does depend upon the diligence of the people. The colonists saw that a government structure would flourish under hardworking, freedom-loving individuals, but would collapse if people became dependent upon the government instead. The fact of the matter is that the main ideas behind the Articles of Confederation were good, but it was the implementation and structure that failed people. There were three main problems with the Articles of Confederation. Number one, there was no executive branch to enforce the laws. And number two, Congress couldn't collect money. And then lastly, number three, Congress couldn't enforce its decisions. The colonists feared the authoritarianism commonly seen in the executive branch of government, so they decided to omit a federal executive branch under the new form of government along with a judicial branch. Another major issue was that Congress had their hands tied when it came to collecting taxes, trade regulation, military strength, etc. These problems led to some major economic consequences. The economic problems came from all over, but one of the primary issues that led to economic despair came from a lack of a singular monetary system. Each state under the Articles of Confederation could print their own money, and each currency varied in the material which backed its value. That meant that the worth of a dollar in, say, South Carolina could be completely different to that of a dollar in in North Carolina. If you know anything about economics, you'll know that an excessive amount of money printed without intrinsic value to back it will lead to inflation. Then to make the rate of exchange so complex across the nation just made matters worse. Congress also could tax, but the states didn't have to actually pay the tax. Because of this, Congress could not raise enough money to provide for the war efforts during the Revolution. Oftentimes, supplies were inadequate and military compensation was slim to none. There were also a lot of other smaller-scale problems that contributed to the Constitutional Convention being held. For example, many states were unhappy with the ways laws were passed and with representation in Congress. Each state had one vote in Congress, but states with greater population felt that their voices were not heard clearly. If every state had just one vote, that meant that states with lesser population would have just as much say as the states with a greater population. To many people, this was seen as a direct opposition to the Republican way of listening to the people. With any law that was to be passed, All 13 states had to vote in agreement on the law. So even if all states excluding one were in favor of a law, it would not go into action because of that one vote of disapproval. This led many people to call to amend the Articles of Confederation. By May 25th of 1787, a constitutional convention was underway. Out of that convention, a document was produced that has lasted 235 years and counting, which is far longer than any other form of government instituted by men. That statement alone is such a great means of demonstrating that it was truly a spirit-led divine intervention which produced the Constitution of the United States of America. Just recently, I was at a Turning Point USA event with my Turning Point Faith team of Chino Hills. We were there listening to Charlie Kirk speak to local students and citizens, and one of the things that he mentioned was how all other nations sort of fell into existence. 
it started with civilizations growing over the years, and eventually they grew into countries of various sizes and strengths. But the United States of America did not fall into existence. It was intentionally called for by the people and for the people's benefit. So how does one even go about the process of creating a government? Can you imagine the pressure of that? There was so much writing on the outcome of that convention. People were on edge with the thought of changing the government structure out of their fear of tyranny. That fear could have very easily led to another war. But in addition to the threat of war was the threat of failure to preserve freedom. Either way, threats were involved. But as George Washington said in an address to the convention, the event is in the hands of God. The greatest struggle was in finding a happy medium of limited power, yet a strength in national government. Two different plans were produced, and another plan became the solution. The first to be introduced was the Virginia Plan, drafted by James Madison. The plan included a bicameral legislature, which uh, favor was then placed on the population of states. That meant representation would be based on population, giving larger populations greater representation in the legislature. In opposition to the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan was presented in which each state was given equal representation in the legislature. Another topic of great debate was that of slavery. Despite what most public schools attempt to teach students currently, The truth of the matter is that a majority of the founding fathers were anti-slavery. During the Constitutional Convention, it was important to see the southern states incorporated into the new structure of government. If war broke out over this matter, the newborn nation would crumble. For this reason, delegates agreed not to abolish slavery within the U.S. Constitution, but that did not mean that a movement of abolition could not continue there in the future. In fact, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution declares a provision for future abolition by stating that Congress would ban the implementation of slaves after the year 1808. And it's like I said, that was a national declaration, but states still had the power to choose for themselves whether or not to continue the terrible act of slavery until it became federal law to abolish it. Breakthroughs did eventually come, but first the supporters known as the Federalists and supporters known as the Anti-Federalists had to come to terms of agreement. The thing is, the Federalists were afraid of unchecked public opinion leading to anarchy and then tyranny. That's why they supported a limited government with more power than before, but having a law of the land in place to check the power of the government. The anti-federalists were concerned that creating a stronger federal government would lead to despotism. Another major concern was that the government would get out of control and there would be no way for the people to maintain and assert their rights. In their eyes, The government was never to be trusted, and that is why they greatly pushed the idea of keeping the power within the states. Both parties saw the wickedness of men. They just differed in agreeing to which source of power would be most threatening to freedom. Essentially, the supporters of federalism understood that a Republican mode of government could easily be led into democracy if there was no law of the land residing over it. And as we have spoken of in the past, democracy inevitably turns into anarchy, which gives way for tyranny. To the Federalists, it was much more reasonable to establish a strong form of government that was in a system of checks and balances than to leave the power to the states and people where people if not given a constitution, would be led by their emotion and not truth, which stands the test of time. The Anti-Federalists could only see an increase of governmental authority, 
which set off the sirens in their minds that were all too familiar from the tyranny experienced in Britain. These heavy topics of debate had the delegates flustered and frustrated. Not only were the verbal communications tense and on edge, but the meetings also took place in a cramped room during the heat of summer. I mean, imagine having to sit for hours on end in a room filled with people you disagree with while feeling hot and sticky and impassioned with a great desire to produce a document with freedom on the line. There were many things that continued to come up in debate. It seemed as though the Constitutional Convention was on the brink of failure because no one could come to a general consensus on what sort of government would be produced. It was then, in a moment of absolute and utter tribulation, that Benjamin Franklin rose to address his fellow delegates. What Benjamin Franklin spoke over the people was truly spirit-led and testifies to God's hand in the success of the Constitution's drafting thereafter. Now, keep in mind, the quote that I'm about to read to you probably won't sound very familiar if you have had any exposure to historical indoctrination, which I'm sure you have. I've always been told that Benjamin Franklin was a deist, meaning he would have denied all supernatural divine interventions. But after hearing his statements during the Constitutional Convention, I know that not to be the case. He said, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our partial interests. Our projects will be confounded. And we ourselves shall become a reproach, and by word down to the future ages. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter, from this unfortunate instance, despair of establishing governments by human wisdom, and leave it to chance, war, and conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business and that one or more of the clergy of this city be requested to officiate in that service unfortunately no funds were available to pay for a religious leader to open in prayer on a consistent basis but the lord heard their cries and he could see that their heart's desire was to honor him and his people. He provided, with many volunteers stepping up to the plate, offering to lead prayer and produce sermons. The delegates experienced many other trials after this moment in the convention, but they were able to face the opposition and receive victory. They were able to continue only after petitioning the Lord for his help. Eventually, an agreement came about through what is known as the Great Compromise, originally titled the Kinetic Compromise. Through the Great Compromise, a bicameral legislature was established with representation given in the lower house based upon population size and equal representation given in the upper house. The issue of slavery was addressed lightly to many of the delegates' sorrow. As I mentioned before, Many were absolutely displeased with a continuation of the practice of slavery, but it was agreed upon to allow the decision to be left up to the states individually. Thankfully, the door was left open for Congress to take a federal stance on the matter 20 years after the ratification of the Constitution. All of this debate allowed for the draft of the Constitution to be accepted by the Congress. But going into the ratification process, 
more problems and trials came about. The delegates were concerned over what electing an executive would look like, and they were concerned over the regulation of trade and commerce, amongst other topics of conversation. Just as I believe the Lord has inspired the great compromise in the drafting process of the Constitution, I also believe the Lord inspired a compromise during the ratification process in the form of the idea of an electoral college. The Electoral College gave states the right to elect the delegates who would vote on behalf of the people in their voting response to a candidate. Eventually, on September 12th, a final text of the Constitution was presented to the delegates. And in order for it to become ratified, nine of the states needed to approve it. There was a lot of opposition, especially with an anti-federalist ideology being distributed among the people. The Federalists James Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton composed a series of essays explaining the Constitution's structure to the people in what is known as the Federalist Papers. These essays definitely helped to enlighten the public. But there was still great concern over the protection of the people's rights, and it is for this reason that a movement towards the production of a Bill of Rights took place. But essentially, after many, many trials, after great discussion, and after prayer and supplication, in 1789, the Constitution became effective. It's absolutely remarkable to see that two sides went through such great frustration in producing a compromise. They threw out so many different terms and conditions in which they felt were absolutely necessary in order to prevent tyranny and authoritarianism. The delegates all desired to produce a system that would benefit the people and that would nurse the seeds of liberty. But on many occasions, they questioned whether they would get through the difficulties of debate. It was only when they bent a knee to God that they saw progress be made. Sometimes we can look at these historical figures and almost forget that they were regular individuals just like we are. In fact, founding father Samuel Adams, a man who loved his nation and wanted to fight for freedom, was actually a poor man that had to borrow a horse to get to Congress. So these historical figures were just like you and I. And how often do we come face to face with circumstances which seem catastrophic? I know personally the weight of their trials did not really hit me until about a week ago when I experienced a wave of trials for myself. I was confronted by a situation in which I had to stand firm on the promises of the Lord. I had to look my circumstances in the face and trust that God would prevail, even though things seemed pretty dark. Instead of fighting the inevitable, being my trial, I made up my mind to surrender it to the Lord. And it was in my surrender that I got to see the goodness of God. By getting down on the floor on my knees, begging God for him to use the terrible situation for good, I was able to have fresh eyes that could observe his hand working in my situation. Just as these framers petitioned for the Lord's hand to move in the drafting of the Constitution, I'm sure they also prayed for the Lord to move in the hearts and in the minds of each and every individual so that an agreement could be found by the delegates. That is exactly what I had to do. I had to pray that God would move in the hearts and in the minds of those around me, in addition to my own heart and mind. And he is so good and faithful. He answers when we cry out to him. Jeremiah 29 verses 11 to 13 even says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. What a beautiful promise the Lord makes to each and every one of us. He promises to answer when we cry out to him. You know, learning about the history of the Constitutional Convention sort of reminds me of the story in Acts where Paul is traveling to Italy in order to speak to Caesar. But along the way, Paul and the ship that he was traveling on was taken off of track. It was beaten up and shipwrecked. Try that for a Mediterranean cruise. (laughs) To Paul and the other members on the boat, 
their journey was far from perfect. In fact, I'm sure a lot of them thought it was a complete disaster. But God was using the disasters and the dangers so that the situation could bear witness to his almighty goodness. There was even a portion of the story where the boat shipwrecks and the people escape to an island near the tip of Italy called Malta. While on the island, Paul was bitten by a viper. Most people would probably hear that and say, now, that's a bad day. But God used the viper to demonstrate to the natives his divine nature. Paul was able to heal the people of Malta in the name of Jesus, and the scripture says they changed their minds in thinking that justice would not allow for him to live. They made the assumption that the viper bite was Paul's punishment for being a murderer. But in fact, God had a different plan in mind. Little did the people know that Paul had already been justified by the blood of Jesus. And so that bad situation that he had endured was not his punishment, but was actually their divine revelation. It was their moment of opportunity to receive Jesus. So God had a purpose with the viper. If that viper had not fastened onto Paul, if Paul's ship had not been taken off the course in which they thought they would travel, then so many people would have missed out on the opportunity to see God's hand move. That is precisely what transpired in the Constitutional Convention as well. The difficulties faced by the delegates in the Constitutional Convention were recorded for good reason. They were written down for the future generations to read and to understand because the entirety of the Constitutional Convention demonstrates to the American people how much God played a role in the founding of our nation. God is so good, my friend. Just as he wanted to use the heated debates between delegates in 1787, he also wants to use the heat of your situation to mold you into his image in the refiner's fire. He wants to use your life as a demonstration of his goodness, and he wants to fill you with joy. A joy that comes even while living through difficult times, where things seem absolutely horrible. But in the midst of it all, God shows up. And in those moments, you can be seen to have so much joy in your life because you know that your Redeemer lives and that he has you, that he has promised you a future and a hope. So I just would love to encourage you, don't give up. Don't allow for the enemy to steal your joy in whatever you're doing or going through because God will prevail. He is the God of all comfort and he is seeking to bless you and to use your life for his glory so long as you allow him to. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode. If you have not already listened to the previous episodes that are a part of our prerequisite to the constitutional study, I would highly encourage that you go and listen to those at your earliest convenience. Rooted to Truth does have a website, which I will link in the description to this episode. There on the website, you will find information regarding the podcast's mission, and you'll also find a little bit of background information regarding my story. If you are enjoying Rooted to Truth and would like to make a contribution to help me continue in producing episodes, please feel free to visit the contribution link on the website as well. I'd love to hear from you and learn about your take on the episodes here on Rooted to Truth, so never hesitate to reach out to me and share your thoughts. Lastly, please do me a huge favor and give a thumbs up or a like to this episode and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening on. It really helps me in getting these messages out to more people. Thank you so much. And as always, I pray that you have a wonderful day. God bless.